All right, so we can get started with a pretty simple one. What is the best way for potential recruits to get on your radar, um, especially given this current pandemic and competition not being so readily available? Um, how can prospective recruits market themselves to you? Well, I mean, it usually starts with receiving an email. Um, uh, obviously, uh, um, I and, and the other coaches um, go to tournaments as well to watch prospective players. And, uh, but usually when it's, uh, when it's time for them to kind of um, bring their information forward to the, to the coach, I usually receive an email uh, mm -hmm. because obviously the first thing we have to see are transcripts and possibly test scores. Yeah. So the email route is the easiest. Uh, certainly gone to YouTube and watched a lot of video. I actually find that very useful. Um, and, uh, you know, UTR is becoming a little more used uh and i think it's again like everything else it's just a another guideline mm -hmm. right so that perfectly segues so what now that utr is becoming more common and tennisrecruiting.net has always been a very reputable source in terms of measuring and metrics of athletes um what would you say you kind of hold more standing in more weight in compared to tennis recruiting utr and like usda standing with well, I think it's important, I mean, from my standpoint, maybe because I've been around a long time, that, that they're all just little pieces to the, to the whole picture. Um, uh, tennis recruiting, yes, lets you know kind of where, there are, where they are on their radar um, as far as the other kids who are graduating with them in their class. Uh, it doesn't speak to what style they play. It doesn't speak to athleticism. It doesn't speak to their heart. You know, it, it is result-based somewhat um so i think it's again it's a useful tool to kind of start the the process with uh utr getting equally as kind of interesting where you know if somebody's uh, an 11 or or even a 10 um that they're going to be a pretty high quality player most likely uh to me the most important thing is to watch people play live mm -hmm. i think that uh, you have to see people in competitive situations, and you have to see how they problem solve on the court, how they uh, how they handle themselves during a match, um, how they strategize. You know, just all those kind of things, which are they're not on paper. You cannot understand the full player on paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to see them compete. Mm -hmm. So would you say maybe their their competitiveness is the number one characteristic you typically look for in a recruit, or are there any other characteristics? I think that's right up there because, as we know, and you've been a awesome player for us over three years, how you're going to handle yourself in big moments is a very big part of winning. Mm -hmm. And so you need to see people under those kind of pressures and see how they handle it mm -hmm. and uh, how they compete and uh, if they get too flustered or too emotional or things like that, it, it's, it, then it's going to be some work to try to get them to handle the moments well um, at the collegiate level where you're playing not just for yourself as you are in the juniors, uh, you're playing for your team as well. So I think it is, it's a, it's a very key indicator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so going on the opposite side of that after things you look for what are kind of some red flags you feel like you look out for when they're on official visits um i uh i probably wouldn't say the red flags are too much on the court i mean sometimes if somebody is unable to control themselves emotionally yes that's a little bit of a red flag yeah. i mean you want people who are thinking clearly through their matches and and making good decisions even if they're not winning that's not the most important thing is that they're winning all the time but how are they handling the stresses of the match how are they trying something different if if they're getting beaten in a certain uh, strategy by the other player uh have uh, watching the player i'm watching um figure out the weaknesses of the other player um those are things that um you know are obviously the positives back to the negatives if you see somebody who really stops competing for a long period of time and and it's not injury related then you've got to wonder well do they really want to do this at the next level at the college level so sometimes lack of competing and lack of uh, match play and things like that especially during senior year of high school is kind of a red flag mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so many athletes often question whether a coach is being transparent with them during recruitment process. It's like, you guys are going through this process year round. It's not, you know, you don't only recruit during a specific season. So how does a recruit really know if you're interested in them? Um, well, you know, Stanford's a little bit different in that uh, we're not recruiting the masses because we can't academically. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if we're talking pretty seriously to somebody somewhat regularly after obviously we're in the recruiting period that we're allowed to do so, um, you know, uh, we don't, we probably don't hit them as much um, as other coaches might do. Mm -hmm. But I think anybody we're talking to on a regular basis is a serious candidate for us. Yeah, for sure. But, but it takes a lot of massaging because people are hearing a lot of different things from different coaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes, and, and obviously we don't try to engage in this, but sometimes there's negative recruiting going on by other coaches who are warning players, well, they're not really interested in you because this and this and this. Um, that's too bad. That shouldn't, that shouldn't really happen. But uh, you just got to go forward. You got to do it the way you've always done it. And, um, and we largely get the players we want. <laughs> um, would you ever stop recruiting an athlete if their parents are becoming too involved in the, in the process? Kind of that issue? Um, well, in the recruiting process, I mean, I certainly had parents who pretty much did the recruiting process for their kids. So um, I don't know that that's a bad thing. I think that you want to make sure when you have the uh, the player themselves, the student athlete themselves in the one-on-one -on -one times, whether it's on the phone or whether it's when they visit, you want to make sure that they're as interested as their parents, if their parents have kind of taken the ball and run with it. Uh, so that would be an important thing to really understand from the athlete if they're the ones who really, they really want to, uh, to come to that school and they're 100% behind it. I, I don't read too much else into the parent involvement. I think it's an important decision. I'm glad parents are involved in the decision mm -hmm. because college is not a, um, it's not a four-year decision. It's a life decision. Yeah. And so I think that the family should be involved in the process of what's best for that person in many, many different areas and not just tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's about what degree you get. It's about, uh, you know, the school. It's about where you go to school in the country because that affects your family and things like that. So I think it, it, it's a very, very major decision. And I think it's fine and a good thing, actually, if the family is a little more involved in the whole process. Yeah, so for me personally, I remember being really nervous to bring out scholarships and I know like kind of parents tend to think about the financial um, burden for many of the student athletes. So I know that's not an easy topic to talk about, but how would you prefer a recruit bringing that topic up? Would you rather have I you? Think, yeah, I think that people have to be very direct. In fact, when I'm early in the recruiting process and let's say we're two years out from that recruit year, mm -hmm. um, just even uh, doing the stuff that we're allowed to do, the emails and things like that, you have to be uh, pretty straightforward on whether you think you have aid for that player or not. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure, then you've got to say we're not sure because you know we're not close enough to the situation. We're not within a year or we're not within, uh, for me to know, uh, yes, we consider you at the level that we would um, be interested in you coming on a scholarship. Um, the, but the majority of time, as we know, the answer is no, 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 we're probably not going to have aid for what you've done to that point in tennis. You know, it, it can change. And I tell people sometimes, well, you know, you've still got a year and a half or something and you can really wow us. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think it's, it's clear to um, at least to give somebody a preliminary understanding of whether you see them being able to come on scholarship or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so social media has now become kind of a very, very prominent force in the recruitment process. And I know that like within the new media right now, there's a lot of like insensitive tweets happening and people losing their scholarships over it. Um, so do you ever look at a social media, a social media of a recruit? And if one does, what you kind of, how does that play into your decision, I guess? Or well, as you probably are very aware, I don't look at social media very much. 
And I would never, anything anybody has to say, um, you know, in this current um, situation that we're in with the, with the BLM protests and, and everything else, I mean, that's somebody's personal opinion and that then everybody should be comfortable expressing it. Mm -hmm. If it were something that I thought were really going to harm our team, in other words, if somebody exhibited behavior or thoughts that were not inclusive mm -hmm. to, um, to a group of people or to um, in a situation, I, I then that would make me think twice about whether that person would be a good fit. Yeah, for, for, sure. for sure, especially with how diverse our team has been in the past. I think that's a yeah. really important part of our team culture. Um, another thing that I had a question specifically about is as many great players are now foregoing college entirely, that trend is kind of shifting, but it's still pretty common for really good tennis players to leave. Um, what would you say to prospective tennis players who might be considering going pro instead of college? How does that uncertainty about going pro impact how you recruit them? Well, we've lost a lot of players as have had the other top programs in the last, you know, even 10 years um, uh, who have decided at the last minute to turn pro. Um, I think for just about every single one of them, one year of college would have been helpful for them. Uh, just from a maturity standpoint, just because going on tour is, is um, you know, it's a job, finally. It's a job. It's a career that you're going into. And not everybody's ready to do that at 17 or 18. So I think uh, one year on, on your own is something that would actually be quite useful for just about every one of them. Um, but people are different and they have different thoughts and they, you know, some people, as we know, don't really want to go to school. <laughs> So, um, and so therefore, school is a lot of work and a lot of effort. So if you're absolutely certain that you do not want to go to college, at least at that age, then it's probably a good decision not to put yourself there and be miserable for a year or two even before you consider the tour. So I think it's an individually based kind of deal. Obviously, you have to have some really good results. Um, to make, uh, to make turning pro uh, at 17 or 18 um, viable. Uh, I also think that, that they have to really understand that it's not gonna be that simple and they're gonna struggle mm -hmm. yeah. for a couple of years. It's gonna take a while till they really have it down that they, you know, that the, the level they're moving into is really good. Mm -hmm. And um, it's gonna take a while to adjust. What, so going off of that, you talked about how even just one year will impact a, student, a tennis player. What do you think one thing that junior players lack, but they quickly learn as a Stanford tennis player, what characteristic do you think they gain or skill? Well, you know, for our players, as you know, uh, time management, the ability to multitask, the getting a lot done in short period, you know, without having a tremendous amount of time, you have to be able to handle that. Now, the kids who are coming in, who are top students, as you were, and, and uh, other people, well, they've, they've kind of learned how to do it a little bit in high school already. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so college and, and the coursework in college is a kind of an immediate shock to some and not much of a shock to others. It uh, just depends a little bit of what your background has been. Um, in uh, what you've done online school, it's a little more of a shock, the classes initially. Uh, if you haven't done online school and you've been carrying six courses and going to school a lot of the day and not having very much time to practice and things like that, then it's not going to be a shock <laughs> to it, um, to you. Uh, the distraction, you know, early on in college is that you're meeting so many new people. They're very fascinating. You want to get to know a lot of people. You want to um, just engage in conversations a lot and spend a lot of time just talking to people. Mm -hmm. And you quickly learn you can't do it as much as you want to do because that actually takes a lot of time, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the, especially in the evening or around dinner time or things like that. Mm -hmm. So you have to cut back a little bit on when you're trying to practice and, and do your workouts and things like that uh, in the best way, that means you have to sleep properly. Uh, you, in order to study well, you have to get rest. 
so you, you kind of have to put it together a little bit that you can't be up talking to people till 2 a.m. every day. Very true, very true. I interviewed Christy and she talked all about that her freshman year, how she had a little bit of trouble adjusting to that change. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, what would you say, you've been coaching for 20 years at Stanford, what would you say has been like three patterns of trends of traits that you've seen that makes this program so successful? Well, actually, let me just throw in that I was the assistant coach for 11 years also. So um, I think this was my 31st year, actually, <laughs> of coaching at Stanford. So, yeah, um, yeah that's a lot of different generations mm -hmm. of people. And, um, you know, I, I just think, um, I think it's more cultural and how the, the world has changed since 1988 when I first started. Uh, you know, that was the era of no internet, no cell phones, no, you know, the, the distractions were a lot um, less in those days. So people, you know, largely, they just, they did other things, but they couldn't be distracted too much with, with what that brings. Uh, obviously, no, no games on the computer. <laughs> you know, I mean, just a lot of ways that you can kind of, I'm not going to say waste time, but do things that aren't necessarily productive to what your main mm -hmm. activities are. Um, you know, then in the early 2000s, uh, those, those, uh, the toys became, you know, available. Uh, we had to put rules on phone use and things like that and on the road, in the van rides, um, at practice, no phones out of practice. You know, we had to kind of institute some rules right. about those kind of things. And, and largely in that, those continue to this day. And those are, those have worked very well. I think we've, you know, gotten everybody on the same page that no, this is kind of practice time. Leave your phone in the locker room unless we're using it to change music on the speakers. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think it's gone very well. I mean, just um, kind of addressing and handling how much with technology and with other things, the evolving that has happened in the world mm -hmm. is really kind of staggering when I kind of think about it for a while. And right. my think time is my two hours of two to two and a half hours of commuting every day. <laughs> When I'm driving into work and I've got a little over an hour and then I'm going home after, you know, with an hour and a half of commute time, that is my think time. That's when I'm alone in the car and I think about, well, what happened today? What, you know, were, was that a positive thing? Was, did we go off on a track that we shouldn't have? Did, are we moving toward being ready for the next competition? It's really when I have uh, all my, all my think time. Yeah. Yeah, that must, <laughs> that's a different shift for sure. Um, since it's your 31st season as a coach at Stanford, how would you describe your coaching philosophy? Um, you know, when I worked under um, Frank Brennan for the 11 years, and Frank was my junior coach since I was 10 years old. And so we had a relationship basically almost my whole life. And so, uh, and I had worked for him for summer camps um, almost most summers till I was between the ages of 15 and, and 23 or four, I worked a little bit for camps. Mm -hmm. And, um, so obviously a lot of what I know as a coach evolved from how he was, what, what his philosophies were and things like that. The difference between he and I is that personality wise, we're very, very different. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we complemented each other uh, in ways that he and uh, that uh, myself and Frankie complemented each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but the biggest thing is you have to be yourself. You have to be yourself. You, you can't pretend you're going to act like somebody else who's maybe a little more kind of, um, you know, extrovert or something like that if that's not you. Mm -hmm. uh, People will see through you and they don't like, especially people, young adults or, or late teenagers or whatever we want to call 18 to, uh, to 22, 23, they largely want it to be pretty real and they don't want somebody coming off and not, and behaving in ways that they don't think is kind of natural. Mm -hmm. So, um, so again, just being yourself, trying to come to terms with how you think the way you look at things the way 
in my own mind, the way I see things, how can I bring that to the group in a way that represents me mm -hmm. and make them better? I mean, all we're, what we're trying to do within this group context is obviously our mission is to uh, practice hard, play hard, win as much as we can. <laughs> That's, but, but the other stuff is life lessons, uh, getting along with people, uh, maturing, uh, time management in college, how, where, where you should be focusing your academic uh, thing. What do you want to do after, even if your tennis is going to be a career for a short while? And for most players, it's not going to be a career for a while. Where are you heading and why? Are you going in the right direction? I, I've given a lot of input to people on whether I think they're, they're absolutely going in the wrong direction. Um, so it's just it's it's all about growth and maturity and 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 being ready to go on to the next thing having a good career path having a good being comfortable in your lifestyle um you know being devoted to family i i'm big on that mm -hmm. um and uh just you know it's a, it's a very very important time of life mm -hmm. where you start to put things together in your own brain really completely with you still have influence of your parents and your family and and coaches and things like that but you're starting to process everything really for yourself mm -hmm. right. and I think it's really important that, um, that that it's that general moving through the college years and being ready for what comes next yeah um, so last serious question Lily if you could travel back in time to when you first started as an assistant coach 31 years ago what would you tell yourself now well, probably my first thing I would tell myself is it's not always going to be this easy. <laughs> my first three years, we, we won national championships. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Frank was on a six year in a row string of national championships between 1986 and 1991. We had great players. Mm -hmm. We we weren't always cohesive within the group, but that's kind of speaks to our talent a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I would probably have said, you know what, it's not going to be this easy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but it, it but it's been uh, it's been an incredible ride. It's just uh, I can't even imagine. I I came in with the idea that I would do it for three months, and then I said that I would play out the year. And at that point, I was kind of hooked a little bit, and I decided that coaching was something I really um, could see myself doing for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, and 31 years later, I'm still doing it. So, um, you know, that's unusual in the world today, mm -hmm. to stay with a job that long. It's very unusual. Um, and, but one of the reasons that coaching is really rewarding, other than the fact that your people are constantly maturing and changing and and evolving and all those kind of things is that is that no year is the same mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so everything you have to bring different skills all the time because you have different sets of challenges mm -hmm. to every year yeah. and uh you know we have a set of challenges right now which is why did this happen and it mm -hmm. kind of screwed up my college years you know kind of thing yeah. and um and yeah, so there's going to be a lot of lessons to try to, you know, keep everybody in perspective and things, disasters happen and we just, we have to be able to kind of go with it and, and, and work toward making everything as good as it can be again, so that we can be productive in the ways that we want to do it. And that's, you know, that's our challenge right now. <laughs> and it's a pretty big one. That's a pretty it is a big one. <laughs> All right, Lily, fun questions now. Um, can you describe a match you wish you were playing instead of coaching? Um, it can be any level. Probably collegiate would be easier, but. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I wish I were playing. You know, I, it's not that that has come across my mind when I watch all these <laughs> matches, but I do dream that I'm still playing. <laughs> and I, I dream that I'm actually in the lineup, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, which is really weird. You know, because I don't know in the dream whether I'm coaching, but I'm also in the lineup or, I, I mean, so I take, 
So I take that current scenario of who's playing at the time and somehow I'm in there playing with that group. So <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it's, it's a very interesting dream that I have somewhat regularly. Mm, interesting. That is really interesting. Um, if you weren't coaching or hadn't pursued a tennis career, what do you think your career would have been? Well, I started out wanting to be a tournament promoter and I did it for a few years. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I did it for my first three years when I stopped playing. And uh, we had put on a tournament that's still going on actually in France, a women's professional tournament. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was going to be my, my career uh, that I designed for myself mm -hmm. during my playing era. Uh, unfortunately, just, you know, circumstances changed and uh, people weren't being individual tournament promoters anymore. They're largely, uh, things went to management companies, basically. Yeah. And um, so that's when I got out because I didn't want to actually work for a management company to do, to do my tournament. <laughs> okay, that seems very on brand, Lily. Um, lastly, what, was, what makes coaching at Stanford or Stanford in general so special as you were a player here as well as now been here as a coach? Uh, the people. You know, all of you guys uh, through 31 years, just amazing people. Uh, great people to work with. Uh, we've had people who weren't very open-minded about a lot of things when they came in, depending on where they grew up or their background or this and that and the other thing. And then the transformations that you see during four years of college are sometimes just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but all of you guys are great. Um, some need more attention than others. Um, you know, just it's all over the place, just like it would be with any group of people. But, um, but working with the people that I get to work with, absolutely the best part of the job. Awesome. Lily, thank you. That was all my questions. Thank you again for doing this. I am honestly so incredibly lucky to have you as a coach and for all the chances you took on me those four years ago. Um, LRT Sports appreciates your time, your insight. So thank you again. Can I ask you three questions? <laughs> if you want. Um, do you want people to know that you had kind of an accident your first week of school, but you, but you kind of carried on like nothing ever happened? What was your fortitude to do that? <laughs> I wanted to play. <laughs> I wanted to play really badly. I didn't want to miss that opportunity to play all Americans or was it all? I think it was, I think it was all Americans. I'm not yeah. sure. But, um, yeah, that was freshman year wanting to prove myself um you know kind of unfortunately couldn't go because the risk of me losing my teeth they're a lot worse than yeah. not being and playing that tournament but um yeah that was definitely yeah was so tremendous determination uh, exhibited in the first week of school uh what is the biggest surprise for you about stanford women's tennis program biggest surprise I think what's been really, I wouldn't, I guess not surprising. I just wasn't expecting how much of a family it is after talking with Christy and also just talking to all the alumni in general. It's like, once you leave this program, you're not really leaving it. You're just entering a whole like lineage of people that have been through this program and experienced the same thing you have, but it's like slightly different. So you get a whole just awesome community outside of this team as well as like bringing in such talented people that want to work together. I think it's really odd and rare to see girls, let alone very talented girls, to want to work together towards a common goal. So I think it's been really awesome to find that community. Yeah, you graduate to the alumni thread as they call it. Yeah, during the I me about it. She's like, it's just a hundred group messages about everything happening during the NCAA tournament. I'm like, I'm so excited. I'm so ready. So funny. Uh, what's the best class you've taken? Oh, oh, best class I've taken. I think one of my favorite classes I've taken has been like the art studio classes. Those have been my favorite. I've taken um, a black and white photography film class. And like, I got to like develop the film myself and like got to go in the dark room and like completely make it like just completely do it all hands on. And so that's been really fun. Um, but there have been some classes that I've really enjoyed. They've just been ridiculously too hard that I'm like, I I understand. I love the material, but you're making this so hard for me to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I, I concur with you. I remember some of my favorite stuff was way out of my area that I was trying to stay in, but it was still fun. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate how 
I do kind of wish I challenged myself more in terms of like the major I ended up doing. Like I love STS and like all the flexibility it provides, but I think my one regret so far, damn, I already have a regret of having graduated yet. But um, my one thing that I really kind of bug myself about is like not taking the opportunity to like explore majors my freshman year. I think I took the backseat a bit about sophomore year because like you didn't have to declare till end of sophomore year. So it's kind of just preloading um, freshman year. So had I like planned better, I would have tried to do like MSN e or something more, a little bit more rigorous just to push myself. But I don't know, STS is great. And I'm able to take some harder classes now that I'm finishing up the major. So it's a give and take. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know. You know, I think you should take the classes you want to take, not mm -hmm. necessarily have to major in it. Yeah, that's true. That also provides a good flexibility as well, which is what I like about STS is that like, yeah. there are some, like I took an ms &E class last quarter that was like super interesting, but I think if I had to take five of the classes that were the same way, I would probably not appreciate that mm -hmm. class as much. So I think like, it's a nice balance, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. That's good. Awesome.